Welcome to the Greg Kong Show. I've got a special guest, Roger Sakella. Did I pronounce that right? Perfectly. Or should I say Dr. Roger Sakella? No, we don't go the doctor thing. We leave that out. I leave that out. Okay. Roger is the president of LensRentals.com. I found LensRentals.com when I was trying to... I was looking for a Canon 5D Mark III SLR camera when I was heading out to Vegas and the Grand Canyon. And uh, so I used your company to get some gear for those trips and had it mailed to, I think it was a, a Fed Express or... Yeah, FedEx Express or FedEx Office. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought that was pretty innovative um, in terms of the gear you had and uh, the reviews you had on the gear and uh, th that was you wearing that lens, <laughs> lens hat? It's the hood from an 800 millimeter Canon. Okay. So, um, yeah, I really appreciate the, appreciated those reviews from you and, and uh, I could tell you don't take things too seriously, which is good. And then um, just recently I, I found you again on YouTube on uh, a CNN money video. Um, well, that's a few years old. Yeah. Uh, do you mind uh, giving your background for people that are not familiar with you, um, your story, how you became physician and how led to you starting your own camera business and, and leaving that profession? Well, I was um, practicing medicine, uh, did for almost 20 years, but my hobby was photography and I loved it. Right. And um, I was going on a trip to Alaska, you know, the usual cruise thing, and I wanted a nice telephoto to do wildlife with and I was really excited. Yeah. But I didn't have any use for it. I didn't, you know, use big lenses otherwise. So I thought I'd rent one and found out in those days you couldn't. Uh, if you lived in New York or LA or Chicago, you could walk in and Basically, give your credit card and buy the lens, and when you came back, they'd refund you everything but the rental fee. Right. But that didn't help me. I, I lived in Memphis, so I, of course, bought the lens, then came home and had massive buyer's remorse because here I've got this lens I'm never going to use again. Right. And I thought, well, maybe some other people would want to do what I did, and I'd rent it around first locally, and well, that, that was a hit, and then I rented my other gear, and then I got a website, and uh, the funniest part to me was... I kind of threw this really bad website together and I had a scheduled shoot. I was supposed to do uh, somebody's, I think, senior pictures for high school or something And right. I, on a Saturday. And, and Friday I looked down and I had to get on the phone and borrow gear because all of mine had been rented out. I didn't have anything in the house. Right. So uh, I thought this might really work and, and started getting more serious about it. And uh, within about two years it had gotten so big that uh, – I went part-time in medicine and within another year left altogether to run lens rentals. Okay, so you didn't dive straight in and start buying all these lenses and camera gear and then uh, decide to leave. It was was a gradual transition. Is that right? Yeah, at first I really didn't plan to leave. I thought this will be something I can do after work and on weekends and really thought, well, I'll get to buy more gear this way. Um, that was what it was about for me. Right. Uh, but it got busier and busier and bigger and bigger. And um, somewhere after about six or seven months, I decided, you know, this might be really a viable business and started investing more heavily. Um, I think my favorite story was uh, I'd been in business about two or three months, and a guy emailed me I'd never met. And he said, uh, you've got the best idea and the worst website I've ever seen. And I said, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not putting any money in my website. And he said, well, and he gave me his credentials and said, I'll do all that for you. And Okay. Built an inventory program and everything else, and all I want is, uh, I think, two and a half percent of the gross every month. Okay. Well, I looked down and thought, well, that's about two hundred bucks. I'm getting the deal of the century. Okay. So um, he he did all the work. Of course, we grew exponentially, and he ended up quitting his day job to do it full time because his two and a half percent added up pretty nicely. Okay. Um, but we've been in business for almost four years before I ever met him in person. Oh, okay. Yeah, wow. uh, it was kind of cool. Yeah, it was it was an interesting part. So it worked well. <laughs> wow. So, okay, at the beginning, so you're, I'm not sure how familiar you were with technology, um, like in your profession, because it's, it's just completely different. So when you first started and you're trying to get put together this website, was 
Was it a uphill challenge for you, or were you already familiar with websites and? Oh, it was all new to me. I knew a little bit. I, you know, I'm like college level could do HTML kind of stuff, but uh, right. I, I bought one of those hundred dollar off the shelf websites, you know, with a e commerce cart and. You know, did did that route first, and then uh, Will, who had come in, the guy I talked about who emailed me, he redid everything properly. But I I wouldn't have known how to do that. Right. And then what what were you thinking at at that time? So, someone that you didn't really know, and um, I guess it was someone who's interested in making a, a partnership with you. Um, like, what was going through your mind, like? Were you, did you have a good feeling about it or were you rationalizing it? I I always had a good feeling about it. I'm not going to say I didn't rationalize. I may have, but, yeah. you know, our, our conversations from the start were how like-minded we were. He was like, this is a marvelous idea and it's just great. And he was into cameras and I was into cameras. And, uh, you know, we'd talk about what gear we should stock and what people would want, what was cool and what wasn't. Right. So he seemed as into it as I was, and I always had a good feeling. Okay. Um, and then, uh, what what year was this? It was about two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Okay. So this is, uh, I think, this is around the time when the the like the Canon SLR started to uh, to gain popularity, especially on the video side. That was a little towards the end of that time uh, when the 5D3 came out. and Things changed quite a bit. Yeah. <clears throat> so was it, are there a lot of competition in terms of nationwide camera rental service? There, there was. At that time, there were probably, oh, a dozen. Um, wow. And uh, it was kind of a cool time because we were all probably growing as fast as we could. It, it was a good idea. Yeah. Um, so we really helped each other out. In fact, we, we had a couple of meetings where all of us kind of, I, I remember one time, this was maybe 2010, we all went to Vegas and kind of had some conferences about how we help each other. We trade, you know, information like I'd find a better way to pack, somebody else might find a better way to check, check renters uh, or try to recover stolen gear. And we shared that pretty much. Um, and uh, I don't know, over time, we, we outgrew most of them. Right. Did you have a particular strategy at the beginning um, to avoid, you know, going into direct competition, or did you like were they serving particular areas of the U.S.? No, I think we were in direct competition, but we were also small, and the market was so big. I remember at that time being terrified that that Calumet was going to notice us and come squash us all. Okay. Because because we thought they were so huge. Um, <clears throat> And we thought we had a great idea. I found out later, I actually talked to some of those people at Calumet who thought we were all insane because we were sending things, you know, by FedEx and they thought we were nuts. Yeah. So they weren't going to compete with us, but I was afraid they would have. And they, at that time, when we were small, they could have crushed us. Yeah. Yeah. The, the idea of, of delivering expensive camera gear through mail is that was new to me because, I mean, Things can happen in the mail, and like, like from my perspective, that was something that was a bit risky. How did how did you rationalize, you know, uh, delivering your gear through mail, and uh, like with the risks, and like how did you manage the costs that go along with that? Well, it was risky. Um... And there were losses. And one of the reasons that some of those competitors aren't around anymore is they lost too much gear. Right. Um, that, I think, was one of the things that, you know, a lot of people would uh, – I can remember emailing somebody who just had like a 5D3 and 3L lenses stolen. And he was like, I'm out. I'm selling my stuff. I'm out. Yeah. Um, I had the same thing happen. We all had it happen. Uh, loss is part of it. My response was I need to get bigger fast so that – Loss is not a devastating thing. If I lost one of my three 5D3s, well, that's really tough. Yeah. Uh, especially if it was printed out next week, so I had to go buy one right away, and that that kind of thing happened. Yeah. 
once we got bigger, loss became a kind of a, a well, you lose something every month, but it's not killing you. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we do a lot of things to prevent loss, and uh, we got better and better at that. But loss happens. It's inevitable in this business. Right. Um, so as, as a large business that, you know, you stock a lot of, of, um, you have a lot of volume, do you get to a point where you can, um, you can get wholesale pricing direct from manufacturers to, um, we could, um, and actually we, we, we are registered to get wholesale pricing from some of the manufacturers. Mm -hmm. There's a downside to that. For one thing, people don't realize how small the markup is in particularly lenses. Cameras are a little better. Mm -hmm. So I don't save all that much when I buy wholesale. Um, and more importantly, I don't know when I'm going to get it. So okay. in, in this business, I can order from you know, a retailer and get it tomorrow if I desperately need it. And yeah. that happens. Um, so those relationships are important. If I order, and we do sometimes in the spring, um, we order big bulk from, say, Canon because we know we're going to have a lot of more lenses in the summer. Right. But when we make that order, it'll get here sometime. We don't know when. Mm -hmm. um, we can't plan on it. So we rather established relationships with several retailers where we're a really good customer of theirs, and that helps us a lot too because when things first come out and I want them in stock because that's when they're hottest, those guys are good about getting me early copies. Right. Um, but more importantly, when we find suddenly we need three more Canon 7200s to go out tomorrow, there are people I can call and go ship this to this guy on my say-so because he's one of our customers and, and he'll get it back to us. And yeah. That, yeah, that's necessary. Okay. Um, so are you, are you very hands-on? on the logistics side of the business now or, or do you, do you have a team that can <laughs> take care of that? And Not anymore. Um, in fact, I have very hands off with the lens rentals part entirely. Um, my skill set was small groups. I work well with five people, eight people. Um, right. now there's a hundred people. I don't, I don't work well with that. I also don't know business by training, right. uh, or, or no logistics. So, other people run the day-to-day -day operations of the rental business, and they bought a portion of this company, and uh, okay. they do it much better than I ever could. I've gone and settled into what I love, which is the testing and quality assurance and repair, so I run that area. Okay. But uh, not only do I not uh, handle the logistics, uh, often I find out about a new product when it shows up on a repair table, and I never know we stocked it. Okay. Well, that's... Um so your your company grew, I guess. Was it beyond what you imagined when you you first started lens rentals? Way, way beyond. Um, I never envisioned anything this big, ever. Um, wasn't my plan, and I wouldn't have planned it. I, it sounds weird. I didn't want to be this big. That that was out of my comfort level. So that's why other people run it now. Okay, well, that's uh, that's great. Great story. I mean, uh, physician turns businessman, and um, you know, it's great to hear that um, success of, of Lens Rentals. Um, do you know at, at 2016, like, where does Lens Rentals stand in, in terms of the camera gear rental market? Well, we're the largest. We have been for several years. and. Um, okay. We'll continue to. I don't see anything that's going to change that anytime soon. But uh, uh, depending on your measurement criteria, we're the largest as far as number of orders filled or number of items shipped. Now, some of the big video houses yeah. that rent uh, to movies, you know, they may make as much money on one movie order as we do all year. But uh, as far as number of pieces, we're by far the largest. Okay. We don't we don't rent the million dollar cameras and two hundred thousand dollar lenses that they do. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so when you were first starting, would you say it's, um, most of your business comes through the internet? I'm not sure if you have walk in like a storefront and people can just come in and rent your gear locally. We're a hundred percent internet. Local people can come pick their order up here. Right. 
but there's not a store they can walk in and place it. So they can order it for local pickup, and we have a, a window they come to and pick up their order. Okay. Would you say using the internet as as a channel for cus to um, to work with customers was that for that time in two thousand seven was that fairly new? In the rental business, it was new. Although you know, Amazon and everybody else was doing marketing through the internet. B and H was huge on the internet, but rental it was new. Nobody tried that. Okay. Uh, so how did you find those those first set of customers when you had so you have your website and you've um, got your your gear listing did they come find you or did you have to invest in online marketing or find an expert to help you reach those customers we we didn't have any marketing at all for the first three or four years okay um, it was word of mouth. And it was so new. I mean, a lot of people would be excited. They'd get on a forum and go, guess what? I, I rented a 2470 Canon from this place online, and uh, they ship it to you. And everybody else would go, really? Where is it? Uh, but I think it was probably our fourth or fifth year before we did any real marketing. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I found you through a Google search, and I think, I think you've got I think the, the top result if you search for uh, camera gear or, or lens rentals. So. Um, sure that that helps for sure it does um, and, you know I think um, we market now and we go to trade shows um, and and part of that has been to reach new markets because I think you know most of the people who hang out in camera forums online know about us but yeah surprisingly there are a lot of people who don't and we'll still go to trade shows and hear wait you can rent a lens online I had no idea <laughs> so do you do you have a profile um I guess in the online business world, there's this concept of the customer avatar where you have a, a really good idea of who that customer is, dem demographic. We actually have several groups of customers that are now quite different. Um, our, our initial customer and still a big part of our business is the serious amateur um, or professional photographer who rents a lens for a special occasion, yeah. maybe two, uh, may rent a camera to try it out, decide if he wants to buy it. Um, okay. Some of those are regulars. For instance, we have people that you know three or four times a year they'll rent a tilt shift. They don't want to buy one because they only use it a couple of weekends a year or telephoto or stuff like that. Yeah. Or try new gear. Um, it's kind of interesting. I'll see somebody and uh, I, I don't anymore since I'm not day to day, but I used to see somebody and go, hey, John. What are you doing with this Canon stuff? You shoot Nikon. Uh, I'm trying it out. Yeah. So that's the the the, the first group. Um, the second group now is the uh, similar person, but on the video side rather than the photo side. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the 5D3 earlier that kind of started the SLR video part, and that got us in the door into video. Yeah. But now we have a lot of people who use us for. Um, Indie video, student production, uh, music video, and advertisement. We don't really do much in the movie television world, but we do a little bit. Right. So that's the the kind of amateur beginning professional there who uses us. Um, and then the third group, which is a much smaller group in number, but but really uh, important, is the professional video that uses us for their shoots. Because a lot of video people, unlike photographers, they're they're skilled videographers who own almost no equipment. Right. Uh, they rent the entire shoot. So, you know, one of those orders may be a third of our business on, on a Tuesday. Uh, and then the other 190 orders are the other two thirds. Okay. So those are the three groups we, we deal with now. Okay. And would you say photographers still out outnumber the, your, your video customers? No. Um, I think this last year kind of went 55, 45 video. Okay, very interesting. Uh, I was I was surprised. I, I I've traveled to South Africa, Singapore, Taiwan, and and Thailand, and uh, there's usually is a local store that will rent gear, but it's more of a traditional. Uh, you know, you come into the store and you can grab the gear. So uh, I don't think that the the mailing. Or nationwide services uh, caught on outside 
um, over there yet. Yeah. Do you plan to expand beyond the U.S. or you, you're comfortable within your your market right now? We're, we're comfortable with the U.S. market, and I think more importantly, we realize we don't understand the market in another country, not just the people or what they'd want, but mm -hmm. the shipping, how the credit card laws work, um, things like that. Yeah. Uh, we tried Canada for a while and just found that we couldn't promise people gear on Tuesday because the Canadian system meant, might get there Tuesday, might get there Wednesday, could be Thursday. Yeah. Uh, whereas FedEx, Tuesday is Tuesday. So that, that makes it difficult. Yeah. And then sometimes there's laws. For example, depending on the country, uh, you may live in a place where if you rent a camera from me, you don't have to send it back. Okay. Uh, and <laughs> basically, that, that's um, not too much of a stretch in some areas. Um, it, the, the, the legalities of what happens if somebody doesn't send things back is, as I said, a lot of my competitors went out because of theft. Mm -hmm. If you can't deal with that efficiently and effectively on both ends, preventing and recovering, you can't be in this business. Right. But every country's got different laws about that, so we wouldn't know what they're like in some another country. Okay. Well, I, w I would think the the U.S. market is is uh, more than large enough, um, you know, to uh, you know to do well in this type of business. And it seems like the U.S. is uh, leading in terms of um, setting the trends for around the world. How do you um, how do you select the gear that you decide to uh, rent out to customers is is there a particular person or are you that guy i used to be that guy yeah uh, early on. uh now like i said we do a lot of video i don't know enough about video to predict that equipment so we have different department heads that suggest things and it goes through uh, uh tyler and tim who do the final purchasing decisions yeah and a lot of times now we're big enough to where we can go, well, this might work. Let's get six of them and see. And if it doesn't work, then we'll sell it and not much harm is done. Okay. It was a little more critical when we were small. And, uh, you know, I, we, I remember um, they, they had some things they called Roger's Follies because I bought them and said, this is going to be great. And then never rent it. Yeah. Uh, the Leica S was one. And they looked at me like, you're going to get a Leica S? Oh, yeah. People are going to love this. It's perfect rental gear. Yeah. I think in the first year, the system ran it twice. So, uh, yeah, that was more critical then than it is now. Now, if something new comes out, we'll probably stock it, see if it rents. And okay. That's like that. So, so there's not too long of a waiting and let's wait and see research period uh, for your business. It's no. In fact, there's kind of the opposite. There's a lot of things that um, it's kind of a secret for our sales stuff, but a lot of stuff we buy and it rents really well for about six months and stops, and we sell it all. Okay. Oh, you. Oh, yes. I do remember. So, yeah, we sell. We have a place that sells all our, our used equipment, usually when it's two years old. But when something's really new and comes out, people mm -hmm. are a little nervous about buying it. So we'll have a line of people going, I want to, I want to rent this the minute it gets to the door. Yeah. And uh, they're, what they're doing is just, I don't know if I want to pay 2000 bucks for it. I want to try it for a week. Mm -hmm. Well, after about six months, that's done. Everybody who wants it has it. Nobody else wants to rent it. And then we end up going, okay, we need to sell this camera or whatever. And it's pretty common, actually, with with different things or new things. Uh, you know, somebody somebody comes out with a camera, especially, uh, that everybody's like, oh, this is, I want to see what 50 megapixels looks like. So yeah, uh, we, we couldn't, you know, when like the D800 came in stock, we couldn't keep them in stock. We were buying them from anywhere we could get them. Uh, mm -hmm. They rented constantly. Every morning when one came in, it went back out that afternoon. And then after about six months, when people had had time to see what it really meant, Suddenly, we have all these D eight hundred sitting on the shelf, and we can't get rid of them. Right. So that's that's a common pattern. And then, uh, yeah, you mentioned earlier that uh, you sell the gear, and uh, I actually bought one of um, a Takina eleven to sixteen lens, and I, I just thought you did a really good job of um, how you you grade. The equipment, like where it is in terms of its uh, condition, so it's just very transparent to a customer. And um, yeah, like at what point did you decide 
okay, we gotta like this is a normal part of the the business. Once gear reaches a certain point, it's time <laughs> to get rid of it. Um, I started really when uh, very early on because I, I remember one day looking at a lens and going, "Well, is this okay to rent or not?" Yeah. And I well, it was okay, you know, a little scratch, but it wasn't too bad. And, and then I sat there for a minute and thought. I don't want to be making this judgment call because I've got a vested interest. You know, if it rents another month, I get a little, you know. So I just read a hard rule at 24 months it sells no matter what. Okay. So that was always the thing. As we got bigger, we found there's often a lot of reasons to sell it earlier than 24 months. Uh, like I, we just talked about, we may have too many or it may not rent well. Right. Um, some things get to looking rough. Um, they're working perfectly fine. You've seen a lens that, well, we replaced the glass, so the glass is always good. But yeah. the barrel scratched up, uh, looks a little dingy, uh, maybe faded. And what we find is, you know, if somebody rents a lens and they look at it and go, oh, this looks beat up, mm -hmm. I may have just taken off the MTF machine and said it's optically the best lens of this type I've ever seen. doesn't matter. They're going to be convinced and looking for something to be wrong. Mm -hmm. So we start selling things because they just don't look what we call rent quality. Right, um, and those are actually very popular because what happens is the smartest guys who really know gear yeah. love that stuff because it's cheap, but it works great. Yeah, so uh, it kind of works out well for all of us. Yeah. What do you? I'm not sure if you've been following um, in the video world the the trend towards uh, 4K um, mirrorless cameras. Mm -hmm. Have you been um, following I that? And that's I, I know of it, but it's kind of outside my area of expertise, so I couldn't make comments as to the plus minus why or what. I okay. uh, just know that it's there. Okay. Um, I just just seeing if um, you know, like uh, lens rentals is is starting to look at um, like stalking, like that type of gear. There's things like drones. Uh, there's uh, the cameras. We stock everything. I mean, we carry reds. We're going to carry airy pretty soon. Yeah. Uh, so we certainly are way into 4K drones. We looked at and decided absolutely not. Is that uh, just because there's so much controversy and uh, regulation around that that area and the well, risk? A little bit of that, but also there's there's a, a reality of rental. Um, and when I when we decided about drones, what I did is I bought one took it out, it was a good drone, yeah. put it together, took it out front, learned how to fly it, crashed it three or four times, <laughs> gave it to another guy, said, here you go, take it out of the box, don't read the directions, see if you can fly it. He crashed it about 12 times. Okay. You know, there's a learning curve. Yeah, there is. Renters want it on Friday to use on Friday. They're not going to read the directions. They have it out of the box because they're going to pay for three days. So the drone is going to crash. And guess what? It's going to be a bad drone. You guys sent me a defective drone. Yeah. Um, and we just decided there was no way we were going to let somebody hang their gear from our drone or depend on our drone. Mm -hmm. uh, we can write all the disclaimers in the world, but our reputation is important to us. And if we say no matter what happens to this drone, we're not refunding your money, and then somebody goes, your drone was bad, we refund their money. So yeah. there's some things we just don't carry because of that. Yeah. Um, there's some other things that we do carry, but with a premium, um, I'm sure you're familiar with all the stabilizers that everybody uses now, the DGI and Ronin and those things. Yeah. There's a really tough learning curve. There's also a really high failure rate. Mm -hmm. So, um, they, they often don't work well. And even when they do work well, people have a hard time getting them to work or putting the time into balance everything. Right. But we're not going to break anything when they fail. We may end up refunding a lot of people. But with a drone, we were really concerned yeah. that bad things would happen and, and we'd be responsible. Okay. Yeah, I did notice there's there's some uh, smaller companies that, that do rent those out. Um, uh, yeah, it is, it is a, a sexy area, but also uh, you know, very risky. Uh, I, I think the one company that rents them quite a bit, too, is kind of a shell over a shell. So you're not renting their drone. You're renting someone's drone via them which could help be protective. I don't know. We just decided it wasn't worth the risk. Right. Hmm. Well, what's, uh, what's your favorite setup for, um, 
you, you do more photo work than video. Is that right? Uh, yeah. What's your favorite camera and uh, lens to uh, go out for a photo shoot? Well, I have a, I have a couple. Um, I have a Pentax K3 that I love. Um, I just find that very easy to use for crop sensor camera. It's clear and concise. Yeah. I have a couple of lenses for that, and I use it a fair amount. I also shoot a fair amount of Canon. Um, mm -hmm. That was has always been for me about the lenses. I think there's there's just such a superb lens selection. Yeah, some things you can't get anywhere else. Um, I, I've you know some shortcomings with the sensors, but uh, I shoot a lot of Canon too. If I'm doing kind of any extreme work, really telephoto work, really wide angle work, I'm probably shooting a Canon. Okay. And how did you how did you learn? How, how to, uh, the, you know, get, use the gear, learn the techniques. Was it just self-learning or did you take workshops or did you just get hands-on? Well, on the photographer side, kind of before lens rentals, I took workshops. I was in the camera club, learned a lot online, read all the various forum sites. Yeah. Um, the technical stuff I do, there was nowhere to learn it. Um, camera companies are very secretive about what's inside their lenses. Yeah. Um, so we did a lot of reverse engineering, um, and kind of learned by self teaching, like how to take a lens apart, how to fix things. Uh, we broke a lot of stuff, Yeah. but, uh, it was also very fun. And some of that was just because of, you know, when we would ask, we'd get a very condescending, you guys will never understand all this stuff. It's too complicated. So that was like throwing gasoline on a fire to us. It's like, oh yeah, we, we will now. <laughs> So uh, that 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 part was self-taught. The technical stuff, um, mm -hmm. even the uh, things like the MTF benches and things that we work with now. Um, actually, one of the machines here we designed uh, along with the optics company. Um, so that's all been self-taught. Okay, I noticed you um, you have a YouTube channel. You've got some um, educational videos on things like cleaning the the sensor of an SLR camera. Is that just something you do as a one-off, or do you plan to do more educational videos to support your customers or reach a new, um, new, new audience? We've always done educational stuff. The YouTube channel is kind of languished. Most of those things are several years old, but I think they're getting back into it with more educational things um, and planning to do more how-to because we found out, especially on the video side, people won't read. Uh, I can write a post about it, nobody reads it, but if they put a YouTube video up, people will watch it. So I think they're going to be getting more into that now. That won't be my area, but a, a lot more, you know, how to how to do this uh, quick two-minute YouTube videos. Right. So um, people are not reading your Roger's take, uh, those uh, reviews? Oh, they, they read those, um, and there's a core of people that read the technical blog posts and love them, but... Uh, yeah. Not not the average everyday renter most of the time. Okay. Do you use any other um, platforms to um, educate people, or is YouTube the the main one? I think we do more um, at this point with our blog than on YouTube. Um, a lot of written, you know, how to stuff on the blog and uh, technical articles on the blog. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we're going more into video. Okay. Are you dabbling into social media, Facebook, Instagram? Um, some of the they do. I don't do any of that, but because uh, I'm old. But the young people, <laughs> <laughs> they, they run Facebook and Instagram pages, and uh, I don't think we're really content heavy on those right now. But kind of heads up and coupons and specials and those kind of things get put out on those quite okay. a bit. Yeah, yeah. I, I find it overwhelming. I'm sort of um, in between. Uh, you know, more traditional and then all these, these platforms, it's, it's overwhelming. Uh, so what's, uh, how much time do you, do you spend on your, your business during a average week? Well, um, I refer to myself as semi-retired now. I work seven to three Monday through Friday, um, which is a lot less than it used to be. Okay. Uh, I used to uh, work seven days a week and usually about 10 to 12 hours a day. So, it's it's better now. Okay, and then when you were when you were first starting out, was was it like seventy hours a week? Just you know, 
when I was doing both medicine and this, my usual day was I got up at four, did emails till six, went to work. Then I took an hour at lunch and did emails. Then I came home at four, did emails, packed and shipped lenses, unpacked and shipped lenses, uh, did emails again at 10 and went to bed. Uh, on Saturday and Sunday, I would do all the cleaning and catch up and uh, everything else. Yeah. So even when it was just lens rentals at first, I was usually around 60 to 70 hours a week. Okay. Are you um, a believer in um, a good lifestyle balance between work, family, and health? What's what's your philosophy? I It, it is intellectually I am. Uh, but historically, if I look back on my life, I've worked too much. Uh, I've been lucky in that I've always loved what I'm doing at work, and I always called it my hobby, and I think it was to some degree. But uh, did I spend too much time working and not enough playing? Uh, that's absolutely true. Okay. Uh, what do you What do you like to do on your your off time? Photo shoots, or do you have other? Photo shoots a little bit, but I, I'm a voracious reader, so I love to read. I'll read two or three books a week. Um, okay. Uh, I'm, I love to watch sports, so I go to here in Memphis, the Grizzlies games, uh, University of Memphis Tigers. Okay. Um, travel a little bit, although I tend to be the long weekend kind of traveler, not the three-week jaunt kind of traveler, okay. uh, and that's fun. So uh, those, those are all my enjoyment things, and uh like I, nothing I enjoy more than just kind of sitting outside on a pretty day reading a book. Okay. Can you recommend any? Uh, do Do you read business biography books or more nonfiction? <sighs> I um uh, I usually have three books on my Kindle that are active at any time. I've got a fiction book, a history book, and some kind of technical book, and kind of flip among them as the mood strikes. Um, so uh, it, it's uh, – I, I do, of course, with the, the stuff we talked about earlier, learning, kind of being self-taught in optics, I've had to read a lot of optical textbooks and, and papers and things. Right. I love history and I wallow in history books. But uh, I'm a big post-apocalyptic fiction kind of guy too. I love that too. Okay. Uh, any one book you can recommend for uh, business or – it's uh, self improvement. Not sure if you read anything along those lines. I, I don't read much business stuff, really. Um, I did read several books, kind of, they're all the same note, uh, kind of down and dirty marketing or uh, curbside marketing, kind of, kind of how to books of that. Yeah. Uh, I, I read a lot of biographies of business people, and I find I learn more from that than anything else, whether it's. Uh, you know, Steve Jobs or George Eastman, uh, mm -hmm. uh, two, two of my big role models. Um, okay. and, I, and I think a lot of times reading those biographies kind of gives you more of a picture than somebody's, this is how you do it. It kind of shows you how they failed too, and I think that's important to know. Right. Uh, none of those guys just walked out, well, maybe Steve Jobs, but he failed too. But yeah. they just walk out and go, poof, I'm a multimillionaire. Uh, you know, they, they tried stuff, it worked, it didn't work. And I like the biographies of business people because that's the only time I've ever get anybody's failures described mm -hmm. well. Uh, I've, I've never seen a charismatic speaker talk very much about, well, this is where I screwed up. Yeah. Is there, have you ever faced a, a large failure on, on the business side and something you, you can share and how you, you dealt with that? I've faced lots. Um, crises, I guess, more than failures in this business. We've we've gone on pretty well, but uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> we talked earlier about uh, losses um, fairly early on. Yeah, uh, a guy basically uh, to this day I kind of admire him. He set up a website, made an online presence over several months. Yeah. Uh, rented something, sent it back, looked like a great customer, rented a whole bunch of stuff and disappeared to parts unknown. Okay. And the loss was about 5% of my entire inventory, which is huge. Mm -hmm. And I almost closed over that. Um, it was a really tough time. Yeah. Um, there were several times when I got so frustrated I wanted to walk away, uh, sometimes the work. Um, I think the thing I did worst was um, – if you read much about business, there's always a point they talk about 
the founders disengaging from the business. Okay. When businesses grow to a point, they can't be some guy's business anymore. They have to be real businesses. And I had a very hard time during that period when it was no longer I did everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, the, the one thing I remember is, is somebody taking me aside and going, you can't help anymore. Because I was used to, if packing was behind, I'd go pack. And if inspection was behind, I'd go inspect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was pointed out to me, that was great when there were two packers and you made three. Now there's 12 packers and you make 13. It doesn't make any difference. Right. It just makes everybody anxious. So I wasn't very good at letting go. It took me about a year. Yeah. I, I, I think it's difficult for most founders of, of businesses. It's their baby. Yeah. Okay. And uh, how did that the CNN money um, uh, video like? How did that um, come about? Did they ap approach you at a certain point, or did you meet someone that put you in touch with CNN? If I recall, we had won um, kind of small business of the year award uh, locally, okay. and somebody passed it on. Uh, Somebody at CNN was, uh, they, they had a series they did of small businesses that were succeeding, and we were just one of those. Okay. That, did that uh, video help the business, bring you exposure, or? I'm sure it did, but not that I really could tell at the time. Um, it, uh, if, it, if it made any difference in traffic, I didn't really notice it other than, you know, people personally would say stuff to me, but I'm not sure the business changed very much over it. Probably because it went to a group of people who really aren't likely to be interested in running camera gears. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's, uh, I guess we'll wrap up with uh, maybe one or two questions. Um, what advice would you give to someone that, that's um, in a job that wants to start a business but the business could be risky um you know and there's i mean there's fears and you know rationalization uh, what tips can you offer i i think the first thing is if you're going to start a business there's going to you're going to be afraid don't retreat because you're afraid if you're not afraid and you're starting a business you just aren't very aware mm -hmm. The biggest thing I've seen are people who aren't willing to risk who want to start a business. And I've had many friends come to me and go, I want to do this and I'm going to make this business. But they don't want to put any money into it. They don't want to put much time into it. They just want to have a great idea and then years later it makes money. And that doesn't work. Yeah, uh, I've watched people, one good friend of mine, started four businesses over 15 years, none of which was he willing to put very much money into or very much time into. Right. And they all failed. Um, you know, one after another, after another, if you're not willing to be afraid, don't start a business. Um, and the worst thing that can happen, uh, you, you very early, everybody puts themselves in an incorporation and you might lose your business. That shouldn't be the same as losing your house and everything else you own. Yeah. And if you look at, uh, those stories of all those successful entrepreneurs, most of them have done that. They failed miserably and lost a business and, Maybe lost two or three before they got one that really worked. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's just part. That's why it's risky. Yeah. Um, great. Okay. Well, let's let's end on on that note. Um, so thanks very much for the time, Roger. My pleasure. And Good to get a chance to talk with you. Yeah. And uh, so lensrentals.com. Is that that's all people can find your um, your company is there any other way that people can uh, reach out or is, is that not the place to go to uh, if somebody wants to talk to me they can email me at roger at .com. I'm always happy to chat great all right thanks for the time Roger thank you Greg enjoyed it thanks bye bye bye